Have you ever forgotten your keys, then found them in a totally different spot? As you probably know, memory is a fleeting, fragile thing. So think, if you can't remember where your keys last were, who's to say that there aren't more extreme instances of this very phenomenon? Well, that is actually true to a much more extreme extent when regarding forced confessions. With instances of police brutality finally being talked about, I think it's important to bring some light on a topic that is talked about very little, eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness identifications are used to wrongfully convict and convince people into signing plea agreements. But how accurate are eyewitness testimonies really? Now, I'm sure you've seen your fair share of cop dramas on TV with drama and tension behind one key witness. However, let's not get the real world confused with the make-believe TV one. More often than not, eyewitness accounts are inaccurate, leading to wrongfully convicted people. Though the doubt in eyewitness testimonies has been rising to the public knowledge, there are still people behind bars who shouldn't be there in the first place. Even when fully confident in a memory, there is no reason to believe it to be fully true. As Thomas Albright, a professor of neurobiology at Salk University explains, there are many things that can influence making a memory. These include obvious ones, such as light, distance, personal bias, or the amount of attention on the subject. But there are also less obvious ones, such as stimuli, which include bright lights, loud sounds, and weapons. Now, obviously most of these elements are incontrollable. However, they should be taken into account when hearing a statement. But many times, these aspects are not. I'll give you a rundown on how the memory works. A rather popular school of thought is that there are two different types of memory, long-term and short-term. Now, it's rather likely that you've heard of these two different schools of thought. However, there is much more to the memory than just that. In addition to short-term and long-term memory, the way the brain processes its memories can be divided into three sequential steps, encoding, storage, and recall, which is sometimes referred to as retrieval. Now, short-term and long-term memories often don't differ within these processes. In encoding, there, which is how memories are taken in and processed, there are no difference at all. The encoding process includes visual, auditory, tactile, and semantic. Storage is where the differences between short-term and long-term memory begin. Short-term memory storage. Short-term memory storage is short-term memory is commonly referred to as STM and is only retained through constant repetition. The STM is only reliant for 15 to 30 seconds and for a number from and for five to nine subjects, having an average of seven subjects. Storage for the short-term memory also tends to give a slight favor to memories involving acoustics and sequences that are broken into chunks, such as telephone numbers. Long-term memory, on the other hand, is storage is quite expansive and Long-term memory, on the other hand, is storage is quite large and is stored indefinitely. As one can infer, long-term memory is abbreviated to LTM and it favors strong, vivid memories. This is why you can hear people, which is why people have distinct memories of when they received strong news. 
such as when you hear people talk about when they heard about 9-11. Recall is where the errors are made, such as when, in recalling test answers or, in this case, remembering an alleged criminal suspect. Short-term memory recalls things through the order in which they are stored, whereas long-term memory recalls things through long-term memory recalls things through referral. One might think that in this case, a lineup is a more suitable way of identifying people then. In reality, the opposite is true, as there are no standard ways to identify people. There's an even further difference between this scientific research where the best results stem from when the law enforcement officer has no idea which person is the suspect, thus making them unable to have the witness pick the correct person, where what actually happens is oftentimes the law enforcement officer does know who the suspect is and can pressure the witness into picking the certain person. Seeing is believing. This catchy statement is proven false not only by magicians, but by years of neurological research. According to the Innocence Project, from the 1980s to 2018, over 150 people were wrongfully put to death. That's a lot of people, right? Well, in just over 70% of those cases, of the people who were wrongfully convicted, they had an eyewitness misidentification, 41% of which were cross-racial. Not only is that a major misidentification, likely led on by personal bias or pressure from law enforcement, it is even more questionable when you find out that doubt in eyewitness testimony in the scientific community started in the 1960s, a full 20 years prior to the Innocence Project's research I mentioned just a moment ago. Eyewitness statements are often an action related... Eyewitness statements are often the result of an action related to a brief interaction stored in the STM. And as we learned earlier, the short-term memory only stores things in the mind for a maximum of 30 seconds, which leads them to be susceptible to change through the recall process. Now that you have learned the basic ways in which memory works and the contrasts of the justice system in between, in comparison, you'll know which facts are less than accurate when you have the honorable duty of becoming a juror. Thank you.